if you pull out your Bibles at this time, and you can pull out your outlines, whether on version or the app that I just mentioned, or if you have a paper format if you're here in person, and uh, if you'd silent your phone at this time, we started a series a few weeks back entitled Revelation, A Story of Hope. And in this time, a lot of people are asking questions. People are wondering when Jesus is coming back and looking at Revelation again. And uh, how many of you know that we are living in the last days? We are. And especially after this year, right? You were kind of like, okay, we are one big step closer to, to the return of Jesus. He's coming back. And um, he's got a plan, but how do we know that we're living in the last days? Well, one major indicator was when the, the Jewish nation regained their independence as a nation back in 1948. That had to happen according to biblical prophecy when they would regain and form as a nation once again. And ever since that time, God has been bringing back Jews to their homeland. And we see that in Scripture that, that that's a major indicator that we are living in the last days before Christ's return. And so Jesus could come back at any moment, at any time. And as we continue this series, we're seeing that it's really a revelation of who Jesus is in the book of Revelation. It's really about him. It's about what he will do and things that are yet to come. And I want to encourage us with this, that we have to know the living word because it's key to know the written word. You know, in order to understand the Bible, we have to know the living word, which is Christ. Jesus is the living word, the Bible tells us. And so he helps us to understand scripture. He helps us to understand even the things in Revelation. And again, the book of Revelation is a, not only a prophetic apocalyptic book of things yet to come, but it's also a picture book. It's symbolic. And there's a lot of things that we may not fully understand here because God has only given us so much information in there. And, and, and the purpose of this series is trying to dig out as much as we can on Sundays together. But I encourage you to go back and continue to read the book of Revelation on your own and to do research, to do studies, and to dig in even deeper. We're going to cover, as we move forward now into the book of Revelation, we're going to cover more of like an overview uh, view with not all specifics. We're not going to dive into every verse by verse and try to go specific by specific as much as we can. We'll cover some specifics, but not all of them. And so I encourage you to continue to read on your own. And uh, just, it's, just, it's such a great book with encouraging, in spite of all that we may not understand and what is to come, um, I want to look at this because I believe God wants us to know and understand what he's communicating to us through this book. So we just finished the seven churches and what Jesus said to them. And here is what it says next in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. After this, I looked, and again, the Apostle John is writing here, and he says, And there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And so again, John is writing here, and he says, After the first vision I had of seeing Jesus, and Jesus confronted him and encountered him and said, I want you to write to the seven churches and dictated exactly what he wanted written to the seven churches. John here says he has another vision after that time period of seeing into heaven. And so Jesus here, we see, invites John to come up and see what will take place after this. Now, after what is Jesus referring to when he's saying this? What's going to happen after this? Well, he's referring to, we just talked about the seven churches. So he's saying, after the seven churches or after the church age, when the church age comes to an end, I want you to see what's going to happen after that period of time. So I want you to see, I'm going to show you, and he brings him up to heaven in this uh, vision that he has. And so this is what we're going to look at today. And John goes at, uh, on explaining that he was in the spirit, meaning, or in other words, he was having an in-body or an out-of-body experience through the Holy Spirit where he was seeing heaven. However that was played out, we don't exactly know either way, but he was seeing heaven with his eyes and what Jesus was wanting to show him of what would take place after this. And so after the church age, what is to come? Well, many scholars say that within these two verses, we see a glimpse of where the rapture will take place. 
And I want us to look at today why that is or why that would be the case. Why Jesus was talking or implying about the rapture here. We know from scripture that Jesus will return for his church also known as the rapture. Right? We, we know that? We've heard that? The rapture, if you didn't know, is when Jesus will return to earth and won't actually come to earth, but he's going to return through the sky and he's going to take his bride, the church, or the body of Christ to be with him in heaven forever, for all of eternity. Now, some don't believe in the rapture because you won't find the word rapture in the Bible, which is true. You can look throughout from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find the word rapture anywhere. At the same time, from Genesis to Revelation, you won't find the words Trinity or even the Bible. But we believe in those. There is a specific meaning because they're true. And so we're going to look at different beliefs today on the timing of the rapture or when it will take place. Recently, there was an alarming survey done among believers and Christians through LifeWay Research where it was said that 25% of Christians through this survey are saying now that they no longer believe in the rapture or the literal return of Christ for his church. And this number and percentage is increasing. That's not good. Because we see it in Scripture, and Jesus even talks about it within Scripture. And so how can this be? Because Jesus in Scripture talk about the rapture, talk about his return and that he's coming back. Well, I, one reason I believe is this, if you've been a believer for decades, if you grew up in the church, you will recall that the church used to preach a lot on the rapture back in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. There was this passion, there was this drive, there was this calling to talk about the rapture and the return of Christ. And since that time, we've gone away from that. In fact, if you remember back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, do you remember those Christian films, A Thief in the Night series, anybody remember those? Okay, some of you, or maybe even more recent in the late 90s, uh, the Left Behind series into the early 2000s with Kirk Cameron, you know, uh, kind of a cheesy, cheesy uh, rendition of uh, the rapture and the return, but we've seen those, and churches used to show the Thief in the Night series back in the day, decades ago, in their services, and many people would surrender their hearts and lives to Jesus by watching this rendition of the rapture and what it, what it could potentially be like when Christ returned for the church. And if you were young at the time, like myself, growing up in the church, I'd watch those movies and I got scared. And so I accepted Christ, again, maybe for the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth time because I did not want to miss the rapture on earth. In fact, I don't know about you, but in that time period when I would come home from school or come from being a plane outside and I would come back into the house and I couldn't find my mom because my dad was at work I was I got scared let's just be honest I got scared and I would look in my mind I thought it was for several minutes that I was searching for her until either I found her or she found me or something and it may have been only a couple minutes but I got nervous I got scared that I had missed the rapture because of these movies and since that time again churches have gone away from talking about this event or talking about it as frequently, or even talking about it at all. And now we have a group of believers, as we ju I just mentioned from this recent survey, who have either not been taught about the rapture, or who don't believe it is a literal thing because they become tired of waiting for Christ's return, and they begin to doubt and think that it's not going to happen, which is not a good thing. But that's why Jesus addressed the seven churches that we just covered in chapters 2 and 3, within the church age to hold on to the truth, to endure, to not let go or become weary in loving and serving him. Otherwise, over time, we can become unfocused and begin to allow doubt to creep into our faith and our, in our beliefs in Christ and in the word of God. And so in regards to the rapture, here's what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verses one through three. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms, and if that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. 
So Jesus said he was going to heaven to prepare a place for each and every one of his believers. Everyone who's accepted them into their hearts and their lives and are living for him. And that he would come back one day and take us to heaven. It's a picture of the rapture. It's a picture of his return. It doesn't get any clearer than that, than Jesus himself speaking to this and reading these words. And so Jesus will return for his bride, the church, which is the rapture. Now, Jesus also says in Scripture that he's coming soon. We see it in the, in the Revelation, the seven churches that he addressed, but we also see in the New Testament, Jesus says, I'm coming soon. I'm coming back. And we need to be ready for his return, which is the rapture. With this, we must understand that the rapture is not the second coming of Christ. When we read in Scripture about the second coming of Christ or about his glorious appearing, which is also termed that, in the New Testament, it's not the same event as the rapture. The second coming is when Jesus will return after the seven-year tribulation when he comes to conquer the Antichrist, the false prophet, and he will lock up Satan for a thousand years while he rules in his millennial reign here on earth. In fact, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the apostle Paul talks about the rapture in verses 51 and 52 and that it's for believers only, he says. Because he says, in a blink or a twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will be raised first and the church will be raptured. The church will meet them in the air. They're going to go to heaven. And then in Matthew 24, 27, Jesus talks about his second coming at the end of the tribulation, which involves Israel and the Gentile nations who are not following the Lord. And so the rapture and second coming are two different events. The rapture is for the church. The second coming, or the glorious appearing of Christ, is for Israel and the Gentile nations. Now, there are three major beliefs that I want to look at this morning, briefly, in regards to the timing of when the rapture will take place. We obviously don't know exactly the time, according to what Jesus tells us in Scripture, but there is different beliefs on this, and I want to look at those briefly this morning. The first is this. It's the pre-tribulation, and this is the belief where the rapture will happen before the seven-year tribulation. There will be seven years of tribulation on earth, as we see in the scripture in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation. And these seven years are going to be the most intense, the most horrific time on earth, as the judgment and eventually the wrath of God will be poured out on the earth. Why? Because the world has rejected God. They've rebelled against God. You thought this pandemic was tough? You thought this time of COVID was bad? It's nothing in comparison as to what the seven years of tribulation are going to be like here on earth one day. And we see a picture of that within Revelation. And so we also see in Scripture that the Bible says God is patient, though. He's giving us time. He's giving people time to repent and to surrender their hearts and lives because his heart is that none would perish. None would leave this earth and go to hell. God doesn't send people to hell. He ch people choose hell. It's by our choice of where we're going. The power's up to us. But God is so faithful and he's so merciful and patient, giving us time to accept him so that we don't miss the rapture. But there always comes a point when God will judge. God will always bring judgment. He's very merciful. That's who he is in his character. He's gracious. He's patient. He's long-suffering. or he, he endures over time to give his people time to respond to his love and salvation through Christ. But there always comes a point where God will bring judgment because he's also righteous, because he's just. And he has to do what's right in the, in the long run, it, in the end. And so he will bring judgment, and that's really what the tribulation is about. And we'll talk about the final judgment later in weeks to come. And the pre-tribulation pre belief is that Christ will return for his church right before the seven-year tribulation period. Now, that's what I personally believe in my life as a believer, uh, and that's what I believe that Scripture teaches and what we as a church believe here and teach at Propel. And I'll explain more about why we believe that or why I personally believe that here in a moment. But the second major belief is mid-tribulation, which is the belief where the rapture will happen halfway through the tribulation. So those who believe this view are expecting Jesus to return three and a half years into 
the seven year tribulation. They believe the church will still be here when the tribulation begins and will have to live through some of the intense judgment on earth, but God will spare and take care of believers during this time in order to see Jesus return at the halfway point of the tribulation. That's what that belief means. The third major belief is post-tribulation, which is where people believe the rapture will happen at the end of the tribulation. Now, this thought believes that the church will be here for the entire seven years of tribulation and that Jesus will return for the church at the end of the seven years, and then immediately he will return with the church right back to earth for the millennial reign of Christ. And so some other beliefs are, two other ones, are a partial rapture belief, which is where some people believe that only the faithful, devoted believers will be raptured before the tribulation, and the rest that weren't as faithful and weren't as devoted uh, will go through the purging of the tribulation. And then there's also the belief of a pre-wrath rapture, which would occur about three-quarters of the way through the seven years, which would put us at the, around the mark of about five and a half years or so, which is when the wrath of God will be poured out on all of the earth. And so these two other beliefs comprise of about 13% of believers who believe these two beliefs. About 4% of believers are not sure currently where they stand on the rapture. And so... One thing I, I want to look at is that if, if we believe the pre-tribulation, that Christ will return before the seven years, is if the, if the church were to be raptured mid-tribulation or post-tribulation, we would know the timing of when Jesus would return. Think about it. We're going to know when the seven years starts because Antichrist, according to Scripture, will come into power at that time. We, we will see the change happen on the earth and so one reason that we believe pre-tribulation is because of Jesus says no one knows the hour no one knows the day he could come at any time and so we've got to be ready only the father knows at this moment when his son is returning but whenever the rapture will happen happen we can know for sure that it will take place because of what Jesus and other scriptures tell us in being ready to go at any moment now, I want to give you some reasons as to why we believe it will happen pre-tribulation and why Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 that we just read allude to it. The first is this. The location of John's vision is right for the rapture. What John is seeing here in chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation is a vision of heaven. And then chapter 6 introduces the tribulation period. If you were to continue to read on into that chapter. John, who was one of the first members of the church, is a fitting symbol of the church being taken out of the world just before the tribulation begins. And so Revelation 4, 1 and 2 is symbolic of Jesus returning for his church and bringing them up to heaven, saying, hey, John, come up here. I want, to see, I want you to see what's going to happen next. It's symbolic. With this, the church not being mentioned in the remainder of Revelation indicates it is not here on earth during the tribulation. The remaining chapters in Revelation have no mention of the church in them at all. In chapters 1 through 3 of Revelation, there are 16 references to the church, whereas chapters 6 through 18 cover the tribulation and do not mention the church one time. The natural conclusion drawn from this is that the church, which was so prominent in its over 2,000-year history and counting currently is not mentioned in chapters 4 through 18 because these chapters describe heaven and then the tribulation, which the church does not endure from what we see in Revelation. And so why, it's why Jesus said to the church of Philadelphia that we looked at last week in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, he said, because of their faithfulness to him and because of their faithfulness and love to him and serving him and, and, and following him, that he was going to keep them from the hour of trial, trial that will come on the world, which refers to the tribulation, seven-year tribulation. It doesn't make sense for those of us believers that have followed Christ to then have to suffer the judgment or potentially even wrath of God here on earth for those that have not accepted him. No loving parent would, right? And Jesus talked about how much more even the Father loves us than even we as parents love our own children. 
Another thing we see in the Bible is the restrainer will be removed for the time of tribulation to occur, according to what Scripture says. Well, Pastor, who or what are you referring to when you talk about the restrainer? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Bible talks about and describes the Antichrist who will rule the world during the seven-year tribulation. He's called the man of lawlessness. He's the man of rebellion because he will oppose God and he will claim himself as God and to be worshipped as God here on earth over those seven years. And here's what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5-8 through 8 say. Paul's writing here and he says, Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back, holding the Antichrist back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one, or the Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming, which is the second coming of the glorious appearing that we already mentioned. So Paul is saying here, the restrainer... Or something is holding back the Antichrist from already having, having come into power. Because it's not the proper time yet according to God's timing. And so there's already lawlessness on the earth. We know that. There's been lawlessness for centuries. Because of man's heart. Because of, of rebellion. And it's all throughout the earth today in different ways. And if the restrainer hasn't been holding this back, the Antichrist would have already come. It would have already happened. Verse 7 says here, the one who now holds the Antichrist back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the Antichrist will be revealed. So the question is, who is the restrainer? It's the Holy Spirit. Let me explain why. Think about it. God's Spirit is at work in and through the church. We even see in Scripture that the Holy Spirit is the restrainer of evil in and throughout the world. Evil and sin, he restrains back. Yes, we have a choice to how we're going to live. And people do bad things. God's not going to control our behavior. But at, overall, he's restraining evil and sin to a level that would overtake God's plan and purposes. And we even see in Galatians 5 where the Holy Spirit it restrains evil and sin within the lives of believers. Because it talks about we're, we're called to live spirit-led lives. Don't live according to the flesh. Live according to the spirit. Because our flesh and the spirit are at odds with each other. There's tension there. And so he restrains even in our life. That's why he convicts us. That's why he whispers to us and says, hey, that's not good. Don't do that. That's not right. It's not pleasing to God. And he convicts us and he, he tries to speak to us so that we make the right choice in that moment. Here's the other reason, part of it with it that he's alive and well within the body of Christ accomplishing God's plans and purposes today on the earth. The Holy Spirit uses the church. He's working in and through the church all around the world today to accomplish God's plans. But when the church is raptured, the Holy Spirit represented through the church is now gone. With nothing holding back or restraining the Antichrist to come into power. Think about it, what it's going to be like in that moment after the rapture. That's why it's going to be an intense seven years. The Holy Spirit now is throughout the earth, working in His church, working through His church. The light and the truth of who God is through the Holy Spirit, through the church, is the light of the world. When that's removed, the restrainer is removed. And now what's left? Lawlessness. Evil destruction another reason as to why we believe the rapture will take place the pre-tribulation is because chapters 4 through 18 deal with Israel not the church according to the Old Testament language and symbols used within Revelation this is understandable from the standpoint of the church age again talking about the church age it's the time of the Gentiles according to scripture up until Christ's coming and then the New Testament church was formed, up until that point, it was about Israel. It was about the Jewish people. And then now God is giving the rest of the world an opportunity. He's giving Gentiles an opportunity to come into his family through Christ, 
to accept Christ, to live for him, and to be a part of his kingdom forever. And so we see in Scripture that the tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble or the 70th week that Daniel talks about where God determined in his timing to deal with Israel. And that's what we see in Revelation. Is that after chapter 3, we only see the Israel represented there, not the church, not the New Testament church. And so some of these Old Testament symbols in Revelation are the tabernacle we see in this book. We see the Ark of the Covenant, the altar, the elders, censers, cherubim, seals, trumpets, and plagues. And all of these things are referencing Israel back in the Old Testament. And so that's why we see Israel being represented, not the church, in the remainder of Revelation. The last thing is there is similarity between the events of Revelation 4, 1, and 2 and other scriptures on the rapture. So let me say it this way. None of the four reasons that I just gave you is sufficient in and of itself to insist that Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 refers to the rapture of the church. But when all of them are considered together as the whole, we are inclined to believe this is the case and how God is trying to show us when Christ will return. Again, we don't know the day or hour, but we know the season and what things have to happen in order to come to that place. Now, the rapture is not specifically taught here in these two verses in Revelation 4, but rather we see it here chronologically at the end of the church age and before the tribulation. And so one of the scriptures that has similarities and deals with the rapture specifically is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And I want to read it together here. Paul, writing, Paul is writing to the church in, Thessal in Thessalonica again, to the, Thess to the Thessalonians, and he says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him, those that are believers that have already passed away or died here on earth. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so we see seven key points here within this passage which summarize the truth of what the rapture will look like. Let's look at them. The first is this. It's the realization. Paul makes very clear in verse 13 that he wants us to understand the rapture is going to take place. He says, I don't want you to be misinformed. I don't want you to be uninformed about our believing loved ones who've already loved Jesus and they've passed away here on earth, that they're not going to miss out on the rapture. They're going to partake in the rapture with us. He said, don't be uninformed about that. He said, their spirit really has already gone on to be with Jesus, but their bodies will be raised from the grave first before we go in order to be with Jesus. And so knowing this truth, he says, brings us comfort and hope that we will see our loved ones and friends again. God wants us to have that hope. And I want to encourage us here, even in this moment, just that you may have had family members or loved ones or friends where you're not sure if they accepted Christ before they left this earth. And I don't want you to lose sleep over that. I don't, in, fact, in fact, I don't believe God wants you to lose sleep over that, but to trust him. Because we don't know what happens in those last moments of life. They might not have lived for Christ at all. They may not have accepted him. But in that last moment, I have even prayed with people where I feel like in the last moment there was a switch. And they accepted Christ and they put their belief in him. And God knows how to communicate to them. And even in their unconscious state, if they're in that place when they're passing away, to communicate them and speak to them of his love, giving them one more opportunity. And so I don't believe God wants us to lose sleep or to fret and to, to live in fear that we're never going to see them again. We need to leave it up to God because he's in control. Second thing is we see here in this passage, the revelation. 
Paul's wanting us to know without any doubt, according to verse 15, where he says, this is the Lord's word. He's saying this is God's plan. God said, this is how the rapture is going to happen. And Paul is just repeating the revelation for us. In other words, Paul's saying here, my writing here is divinely revealed through the Holy Spirit, and I didn't make this up myself. These are not my words. I'm not just making stuff up about how it's going to happen. This is God's word, he says. It's written right there for us. The third thing is, is the return. According to verses 15 and 16, at the time of the rapture, Jesus will come again in the clouds. And he will return accompanied by three things. A commanding shout, the call of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God. These things will happen to signal and signify to believers that Jesus is returning for his bride. It will take place. The fourth thing we see is the resurrection. When Jesus comes down from heaven, the first thing that happens will be the dead bodies of deceased believers that we see in verse 16 will be resurrected and reunited to their perfected spirits that have already returned with the Lord. And that's why it says here that the dead in Christ will rise first. These resurrected bodies will be glorified, incorruptible bodies made for the heavenly realm. The next thing we see is the, is the removal in verse 17, which says, as soon as the dead have been raised, living believers will immediately be transformed and translated into the presence of Jesus without ever tasting physical death here on earth. And Paul writes here that we who are alive or who remain on the earth and serving Christ will be caught up together with the dead in Christ whose bodies have already been raised to life again and we're going to meet them in the air. Millions of believers, maybe even into the billions, will never taste death. They'll be raptured in an instant into the presence of the Lord. The sixth thing that we see is the reunion here. Verse 17 also tells us that the dead in Christ and living saints will all be raptured together. It will be the greatest reunion of all time as we'll spend eternity together with Jesus. It will be so awesome that beyond the description of words when all the saints of the church age meet Jesus. So all of the saints that have passed away in the church age, their bodies will be raised and we'll go to be with them, with the Lord forever. The next thing is the reassurance. Yeah, this is all encouraging. Verse 18 tells us to encourage or comfort one another with these words or with this truth about the rapture. You and I, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, are supposed to encourage one another. As we continue to live here on earth until we see Jesus return, we're supposed to encourage one another about these words. Knowing there's a rapture brings comfort and hope to all of God's people, especially when a believing loved one has already passed away. And as long as we're here on earth, we need to always remind and encourage each other that this is all temporary. It is. Too many times we get caught up in thinking that this is all, this is everything here on earth. But I don't know about you, but I'm tired of living here on earth. Right? I mean, we see the hatred and we see the violence and we see the disunity and we see the rebellion against God. We see, the, we see the very lawlessness that we were talking about already throughout the earth in different ways. I don't know about you, but God's created us a perfect place. And ultimately, I want to be there. This earth and this life will end. That's why we should never get caught up in the things of this earth, the Bible tells us. Our eyes need to be on Jesus. Our focus needs to be on his return. And one day we're going to be with those who have gone on before us for all of eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How awesome is that going to be? One other passage of scripture that I want to give us this morning describes the rapture, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 57. And the Apostle Paul is writing here as well. He says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, he says, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. 
Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, it's only going to get better from here, church. It's only going to get better. Not only will the rapture take place in an instant or in, or in the blink or the twinkling of an eye, Paul says, but the rapture is imminent and it's our victory. It's our victory moment when we cross from this earth to the eternal life in heaven. Throughout the New Testament, the rapture is presented as an event that from our human view could occur at any moment. God knows the day and hour and we're called to be looking for it at, at any moment according to scripture. It's imminent. One verse that speaks to this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, where Paul says, Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Meaning the rapture, his return. So as believers, we're to live our life today as if Jesus were returning today. Every morning that you get up, you should be thinking in your mind and in your heart, today could be the day Jesus is coming back. Today could be the day, so I better, I better be right. I better get my heart right. I better live right. I better make the right choices because today could be the day. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour, but he is coming back. Scripture tell us that, tells us that. Jesus told us that. And we should eagerly expect Christ's return at any moment is what Paul was saying here. Eagerly. It should be a part of our thought process and how we live for Christ because Christ's return for the church is imminent. Jesus is coming soon and the rapture will happen. It's going to happen. Don't get caught up in the doubt and the belief that Jesus is not going to return in a literal rapture. It's false. It's a lie. It's deception from the enemy. God's word says that Jesus is coming back and he's coming back soon, he says. Now, soon isn't obviously in God's timing, but we see the times of the seasons that we're living in that Jesus talked about we see the major indicators of where we're living in the last days, and we need to be ready. We need to be ready for his return. And only the pre-tribulation position allows for an imminent, any moment, without a sign, coming of Jesus for his church. Meaning, if you believe that Jesus will return before the tribulation, we can honestly say that Jesus may come today. For mid-tribbers, the rapture is at least three and a half years from now if it's a seven-year tribulation. Since they believe that he will come halfway through the tribulation. For post-tribbers, it's at least seven years from now because the tribulation will have to happen then if Christ is going to return for the church in the rapture at the end of the seven years. But Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour of his return, only the Father. Only the Father. So we've got to be ready. We've got to live ready. Are you with me? So the rapture is our victory through Christ, and believers here on earth will not experience the sting of death that Paul talked about. Finally, I want us to look at Jesus' return for his church is the blessed hope. It's the blessed hope. Paul writes to Titus in chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. He says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness, and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Verse 13 says, while we wait for the blessed hope, which is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Understand, church, that God intended the rapture or the truth of the rapture to be a comfort and a blessing to his people. We should not live in fear about the rapture. We should not be anxious about it in any way, shape, or form. It's our blessed hope. As 1 Thessalonians 4.18 said, and that we already read a little bit earlier, we should comfort one another in regards to the rapture. Think about this for a moment. Think about this truth of why we should comfort one another about the rapture. If Paul taught a mid-trib or post-trib rapture, would the truth of the rapture be that comforting to us as believers? 
if believers knew that they would have to endure three and a half years of the tribulation, or maybe the full seven years of the tribulation, would the thought of the rapture be that comforting to us? I don't know about you, but that wouldn't be comforting if I have to live through three and a half years of judgment here on the earth, or potentially go through the wrath of God here on the earth. And so the blessed hope that we have as believers is our confidence in knowing that Jesus will return for his church. Now, he could return whenever he wants to. I could be wrong about the pre-tribulation. It's not my will that has to be accomplished. It's God's will. So I surrender my thinking and my beliefs to the Lord's will. But out of Scripture, this is what I think best teaches on why Christ will probably return before the tribulation. The point for us is that we need to hang on to this truth that Christ is returning at some day. And we need to be ready for the rapture because it will happen at any moment in the blink of an eye. As fast as you can blink your eye, that's how quick Christ is going to take his church from the earth. Just like that. There's not going to be a minute to make up your mind about whether you're going to follow Christ or not. It's, it's here and now. It's gone. And so we need to live ready. We need to be ready. We need to be living and staying in love with Jesus. Be passionately in love with Jesus, looking for his return every single day. That's what the scripture tells us. That's what the Bible tells us. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And maybe you're here this morning or maybe you're watching online and if you're honest with yourself, if you're honest with the Lord, maybe you don't know exactly where you stand with the Lord. Maybe you've not been living for him. Maybe you've not even accepted Christ into your heart, into your life to live for him. And I wanna give you an opportunity today, my friend, to receive Christ, to know that you're forgiven of all your sin, to know that you have a brand new life in Jesus here on earth, but also you have an eternal life waiting for you one day in heaven. That whenever Christ returns, you're gonna be a part of that for all of eternity. The best is yet to come. And so if that's you, if you're here in this place or you're watching online today, I'm gonna pray a prayer and I'm just gonna ask that everybody repeat after me. But if, if you're wanting to accept Christ, as we pray that prayer, I encourage you just to simply and honestly before the Lord in your heart and with your words, you mean it and Christ will forgive you of all your sin. He's gonna give you a brand new life and you have eternity one day with him in heaven. Let's pray and if everyone would just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross for me. I repent of my sin. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. I receive you now into my heart and into my life. And I am choosing to live for you for the rest of my life here on earth. And Jesus, I look forward to seeing you face to face. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truth of your word. We thank you for telling us and showing us in your word that Jesus is coming back and that we need to be ready. And so God, I pray that you would help us as believers to continue to stay ready, to be ready, to live passionately and, and stay in that passionate love for you, Jesus, through the relationship we have with you. Lord, I pray that you would continue to help us to stay close to your word and the truth of your word, that our, our eyes would be open. You would speak and, 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 and encourage us through your word, even as we are living in, in these last days. And we thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. Lord, and we are looking forward to all of eternity with you. In Jesus' name we pray.